So you mentioned uh, fMRI. What is it and how is it used in studying memory? This is actually the reason why I got into this whole field of science. When I was in grad school, fMRI was just really taking off as a technique for studying brain activity. And uh, what's beautiful about it is you can study the whole human brain and uh, there's lots of limits to it, but you can basically do it in a person without sticking anything into their brains and very non-invasive. I mean, for me, being an MRI scanner is like being in the womb. I just fall asleep. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I'm not being asked to do anything, I get very sleepy, you know? Um, but you can have people watch movies while they're being scanned, or you can have them do tests of memory, like giving them words and so forth to memorize. Uh, but what MRI is itself is just this technique where you put people in a very high magnetic field. Typical ones we would use would be three Tesla to give you an idea. So a three Tesla magnet, you put somebody in, and what happens is you get this very weak, but you know measurable magnetization in the brain. And then you apply a radio frequency pulse, which is basically a different electromagnetic field. And so you're basically using water, the water molecules in the brain as a tracer, so to speak. Um, and uh, part of it in fMRI is the fact that these magnetic fields that you mess with by, by manipulating um, these radio frequency pulses and the static field, and you have things called gradients which change the strength of the magnetic field in different parts of the head. So they're all, we tweak them in different ways, but the basic idea that we use in fMRI is that blood is flowing to the brain. And when you have blood that doesn't have oxygen on it, it's a little bit more magnetizable than blood that does, because you have hemoglobin that carries the oxygen, the iron, basically, in the blood that makes it red. And so that hemoglobin, when it's deoxygenated, actually um, has different magnetic field properties than when it has oxygen. And it turns out, when you have an increase in local activity in some part of the brain, the blood flows there, and as a result, you get a lower concentration of hemoglobin that is not oxygenated, and then that gives you more signal. So I gave you, a, I think I sent you a GIF, as you like to say. Yeah, we had off-record <laughs> intense argument uh, about if it's pronounced GIF or GIF, but that's we'll, we shall set that aside. I, we could have called it a stern rebuke, perhaps. But. Re rebuke, yeah. <laughs> I drew a hard line. Uh, it is true the creator of GIF said it's pronounced GIF, but that's the only person that pronounces GIF. <laughs> anyway, yes, you sent a GIF, uh, a GIF of... Uh, this would be basically a whole a movie of fMRI data. And so when you look at it, it's not very impressive. It looks like these like very pixelated maps of the brain, but it's mostly kind of like white. But these tiny changes in the intensity of those signals that you probably wouldn't be able to visually perceive, like about 1% can be statistically very, very large effects for us. And that allows us to see, hey, there's an increase in activity in some part of the brain when I'm doing some task like trying to remember something. And I can use those changes to even predict, is a person going to remember this later or not? And the coolest thing that people have done is to decode um, what people are remembering mm -hmm. from the patterns of activity from, because maybe when I'm remembering this thing, like I'm remembering the house where I grew up, I might have one pixel that's bright in the hippocampus and one that's dark. And if I'm remembering, uh, you know, something like more like uh uh, the car that I used to drive when I was 16, I might see the opposite pattern where a different pixel is bright. And so all that little stuff that we used to think of noise, uh, we can now think of almost like a QR code for memory, so to speak, where different memories have a different little pattern of bright pixels and dark pixels. And so this really revolutionized my research. So there's fancy research out there where people really, I mean, not even that, I mean, by your standards, this would be stone age, but, you know, applying machine learning techniques to do decoding and so forth. And now there's a lot of forward encoding models and you, you can go to town with this stuff, right? And I'm much more old school of designing experiments where you basically say, okay, here's a whole web of inter of memories that overlap in some way, shape, or form. Do memories that occurred in the same place have a 
similar QR code mm -hmm. and do memories that occurred in different places of different QR code. And you can just use things like correlation coefficients or cosine distance to measure that stuff, right? Super simple, right? And so what happens is you can start to get a whole state space of how a brain area is indexing all these different memories. And it's super fascinating because what we could see is this little like separation between how certain brain areas are processing memory for who was there and other brain areas are processing information about where it occurred or the situation that's kind of unfolding. And some are giving you information about what are my goals uh, that are involved and so forth. And so, and the hippocampus is just putting it all together into these unique things that just are about when and where it happened. So there is a separation between spatial information, concepts, like literally there's distinct, as you said, QR codes for these. So to speak, let me try a different analogy too that might be more accessible for mm -hmm. people, which would be like, uh, you've got a folder on your computer, right? And I open it up, there's a bunch of files there. I can sort those files by you know alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. And now things that both start with letter A are lumped together and things that start with Z versus A are far apart, mm -hmm. right? And so that is one way of organizing the folder, but I could do it by date. And if I do it by date, things that, were created close together in time or close and things that are far apart in time or far. So every, like you can think of how a brain area or a network of areas contributes to memory by looking at what the sorting scheme is. And these QR codes that we're talking about that you get from fMRI allow you to do that. And you can do the same thing if you're recording from massive populations of neurons in uh, an animal. Um, and you can do it for a recording local potentials in the brain, you know, so little um, waves of activity in, let's say, a human who has epilepsy and they stick electrodes in their brain to try to find the seizures. So that's some of the work that we're doing now. But all these techniques basically allow you to say, hey, what's the sorting scheme? And so we've found that some networks of the brain sort information in memory according to who was there. So I might have like we've actually shown in one of my favorite studies of all time that was done by a former postdoc, Zach Rea. And Zach did the study where we had a bunch of movies with different people in my labs. So there are two different people, and he filmed them at two different cafes and two different supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And what he could show is in one particular network, you could find the same kind of pattern of activity, more or less, a very, very similar pattern of activity every time I saw Alex in one of these movies, no matter where he was, right? And I could see another one that was like a common uh, pattern that happened every time I saw this particular supermarket nugget, you know? And so, and it didn't matter whether you're watching a movie or whether you're recalling the movie. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of pattern that comes up, right? It's so fascinating. It's fascinating. And so now you have those building blocks for assembling a model of what's happening in the present imagining what could happen and remembering things very economically from putting together all these pieces so that all the hippocampus has to do is get the right kind of blueprint for how to put together all these building blocks. These are all like beautiful hints at a super interesting system that makes me wonder on the other side of it, how to build it. But it's like, it's fascinating. Like the way it does the encoding is really, really fascinating. Or I guess the symptoms, the results of that encoding are fascinating to study from this. Just as a small tangent, you mentioned sort of the uh, measuring local potentials with electrodes versus fMRI. Oh, yeah. What are some interesting like uh, limitations, possibilities of fMRI? Maybe the way you explained it is like brilliant with, with blood and it's detecting the, um, the activations or the excitation because blood flows to that area. What's like the latency of that? Like what's the blood dynamics in the brain that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like how quickly can it, how quickly can the task change and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's very slow. To the brain, 50 milliseconds is like, you know, like it's an eternity. Uh, like maybe not 50, well, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, let's say half a second, 500 milliseconds just so much back and forth stuff happens in the brain in that time, right? So 
in fMRI, you can measure these magnetic field responses about six seconds after that burst of activity would take place. All these things, it's like, is it a feature or is it a bug, right? So one of the interesting things that's been discovered about fMRI is it's not so tightly related to the spiking of the neurons. So we tend to think of the computation, so to speak, as being driven by spikes, meaning like there's just a burst of, it's either on or it's off, and the neuron's like going up or down. Um, but sometimes what you can have is these states where the neuron becomes a little bit more excitable or less excitable. And so fMRI is very sensitive to those changes in excitability. Actually, one of the fascinating things about fMRI is where does that, how is it we go from neural activity to, you know, essentially blood flow to oxygen, you know, all this stuff. It's such a long chain of, you know, going from neural activity to magnetic fields. And one of the theories that's out there is, you know, most of the cells in the brain are not neurons. They're actually these support cells called glial cells. And one big one is astrocytes. And they play this big role in regulating, you know, kind of being a middleman, so to speak, with the neurons. So if you, for instance, like one neuron's talking to another, you release a neurotransmitter, like let's say glutamate, and that gets another neuron, starts talk, starts getting active after you release it in the gap between the two neurons mm -hmm. called the synapse. So what's interesting is if you leave that, you know, imagine you just flooded with this like liquid in there, right? If you leave it in there too long, you just excite the other neuron too much and you can start to basically get seizure activity. You don't want this. So you got to suck it up. And so actually what happens is these astrocytes, one of their functions is to suck up the uh, um, glutamate from the synapse. And that is a massively, and then break it down and then feed it back into the neurons so that you can reuse it. But that cycling is actually very energy intensive. And what's interesting is, is at least according to one theory, and they need to work so quickly that they're working on metabolizing the glucose that comes in without using oxygen, uh, kind of like what, you know, anaerobic metabolism. So they're not using oxygen as fast as they are using glucose. So what we're really seeing in some ways may be in fMRI, not the neurons themselves being active, but rather the astrocytes, which are meeting the metabolic demands of the process of keeping the whole system going. It does seem to be that fMRI is a good way to study activation. So with these astrocytes, even though there's a latency, it's pretty reliably coupled to the activations. Oh, well, this gets me to the other part. About yeah. my, so now let's say, for instance, if I'm just kind of like, I'm talking to you, but I'm kind of paying attention to your cowboy hat, right? So mm -hmm. I'm looking off yeah. to the, or I'm thinking about the right, even if I'm not looking yeah. at it. What you'd see is, is that there would be this little elevation in activity in areas in the visual cortex, you know, which process vision around that point in space, mm -hmm. okay? So if then something happened, like, you know, all of a sudden a light flashed in that part of, of, you know, right in front of your cowboy hat, I would have a bigger response to it. But what you see in fMRI is even if I'm not, even if I don't see that flash of light, there's a lot of activity that I can measure mm -hmm. because you're kind of keeping it excitable and that in and of itself, even though I'm not seeing anything there that's particularly interesting. There's still this increase in activity. And so it's more sensitive with fMRI. So there, is that a feature or is it a bug? You know, some people, people who study spikes in neurons would say, well, that's terrible. We don't want that, you know. Uh, likewise, it's slow. And that's terrible for measuring things that are very fast. But one of the things that we found in our work was when we give people movies and when we give people stories to listen to, a lot of the action is in the very, very slow stuff. It's in, because if you're thinking about like a story, let's say you're you're listening to a podcast or something, you're listening to the Lex Friedman podcast, right? You're putting this stuff together and building this internal model over several seconds, which is basically, we filter that out when we look at electrical activity in the brain because we're interested in this millisecond scale. It's almost massive amounts of information, right? Um, so the way I see it is every technique gives you a little limited window into what's going on. fMRI has huge problems. You know, people lie down in the scanner. There's parts of the brain where you, I'll show you in some of these images where you'll see kind of gaping holes because there's, you can't keep the magnetic field stable in those spots. 
you'll see uh, parts where it's like there's a vein and so it just produces big increases and decreases in signal or respiration that causes these changes. There's lots of artifacts and stuff like that, you know. Every technique has its limits. If if I'm lying down in an MRI scanner, I'm lying down. I'm not interacting with you in the same way that I would in the real world. But at the same time, I'm getting data that I might not be able to get otherwise. And so different techniques give you different kinds of advantages.